the What to Next podcast helps you build a TBR of future favorite books. In each episode, Lori and Maine interviews authors and book influencers to recommend books they loved for you to pick up today. If you're an avid reader, always looking for your next free read, then the show is Hi, Julia. Welcome to What to Next podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So happy to have you here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I am a an actor and a writer and most uh, known for being an audiobook narrator. Um, I was a child actor and uh, left the industry to go to college, um, where I graduated with a degree in English and creative writing. And uh, this is, I've been narrating audiobooks for about uh, 13 years, which is just like the perfect job for me. Um, and then my uh, first novel, My Oxford Year, came out in 2018. And my second novel, Thank You for Listening, is out on August 2nd of this year. I love this. All right. So how did you end up doing audiobook narration? Um, what was the path? <laughs> yeah, there, you know, now I think there's, because it's just a bigger industry, there's, there's more of a path. Um, but at the time it was like, you had to kind of, you had to, they had to find you, like you had to be sort of asked to do it. Um, it was not something that occurred to a lot of people to even think of doing. I certainly was one of those people. Um, but one of my best friends in college, her mother happened to be an audiobook uh, director and producer at a company called Brilliance. And at my college graduation, she came up to me and said, you know, with your acting background and the creative writing stuff that you do. And, I, you know, she's like, maybe you'd be good at this. If you ever are interested, you know, let me know. And I had no idea what an audiobook was. I'd never listened to one. Um, and I went back to, I graduated and I moved back to LA with the, with every intention of kind of getting my old job back and being on TV again and, you know, doing on camera. And uh, the industry had just changed so much in the time I'd been at college. And I obviously had nothing recent on my resume because I'd been at school and I was just like, okay, this isn't working. Um, <laughs> what is this job that you have where I get to read books? How does, how does that work? Um, and so I sent her a demo and she responded with, uh, she got the go ahead to cast me in um, uh, two books, two YA novels at the time. Cause when I was first starting, YA was booming. Mm -hmm. And so um, suddenly it was like, they needed younger sounding voices. So for me, that was just the, the happy accident of timing of when I was starting to get into this industry. Um, and I'd say I, you know, I was picking up work here and there, started working for different producers, different publishers. And I'd say it took about three to four years to be doing it kind of like full time. Like I looked up at one point and was like, oh, this is actually kind of my job now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a happy accident. And somehow the path leads you to here. And now you're just, you're well known within the industry because a Julie Whelan book is like, it's one of those like gold standards that people are like looking for those, you know? That's so. very nice. That's very nice. <laughs> So let's talk about um, Roman's audiobooks because I think that's like another beast in itself. Like you start with YA and you've, you've done you've done fiction, commercial fiction, but there's some Roman's audiobooks, and I think the community is a is a is a beast on its own. Can you talk to us a little bit about what does the Roman's audiobook community looks like? You know, you know, from experience towards a narrator. Sure, sure. Um, so yeah, I agreed. Like romance audio is really truly its own part of this industry and it's got its own fans and I adore them. Um, and for, for me, um, I, I mean, the, I write about this a little bit in the book, but like I was, I was narrating romance under a pseudonym, but I was doing a lot of that early in my career, much like the main character in, in my book. Um, but unlike the main character in my book, I continue to love it. I just don't have the time to do it as much as I once did. Um, so for me, it was like in the time that I had kind of stopped though, like I wasn't doing as much of, of, of that, the, I think it had to do with like audible expanding, um, their reach and like, suddenly it just boomed. It became, it became huge. And when I poked my head back into that community, it was like, oh my God, the Facebook groups and the, <laughs> The, the fandoms, and it was just huge. I mean, I'd been thinking about this idea of writing a rom-com set in the romance audio world for like 10 years, um, but I didn't, I, I didn't know exactly what it would be about. And then when I 
like I said, looked up and saw that this was, this had become this massive fan culture. Um, I was suddenly like, oh, okay, that's what I want to write about now. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause it's super, it, they're just there. I mean, it's such a wonderfully like supportive, voracious, um, excited community. And I, I love them. I love them. Yeah. I think it's a audible. You mentioned audible. There was audible escape, which is rest in mm-hmm. peace exists where women's readers who just voraciously listen to audiobooks like consume them as much as much as right, a book a day yeah a book a day because it was 795 like you know mm-hmm. you have to be limited so you're so most women's readers typically read like one book a day and you know it's a pretty typical thing and so consuming in the audiobook and consuming it as a as an ebook it was just part of like the consumption you know and now we have other services and other systems and so we're still in that voracious consumption of like, it's normal to hear someone's like, I'm just listening to audiobook while I'm working. Um, this is like, part. yeah. And that's how people develop, you know, like their, their favorite narrators and they, they know their, their favorite pairings and they, they have like, it was the first kind of community to me anyway, that I saw that really cared about the narrators mm-hmm. that like, you know, for the longest time, narrators were kind of invisible in this industry. Um, and to a certain extent, we still are. Uh, but in romance, no, 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 no. These people have their, <laughs> their favorites. They have their favorites for certain things. They have, and the and because the authors are usually in the indie space, they can react to that really quickly. You know, they can write books for narrators. They can cast their books based on other writers, narrators that they use. It's a it's a much more kind of um, collaborative part of the industry than you can ever do in traditional publishing just because of the way timelines work. Yeah. Oh, gosh, this is so fascinating. All right. So let's talk about thank you for listening. So you yes. gave us a, an elevator pitch. You gave us an idea of what it looks like. It's, it's meta. It's very meta. It's a yes. wrong in the women's audiobook world. Tell us the elevator pitch. Okay. So I'm not, I'm, I'm terrible at the elevator pitch for this. Cause I just, I'm like just starting to do press. So, but so bear with me. Um, it is about an actress turned audiobook narrator who, because of a tragic accident, um, is not doing on camera acting anymore. And also as a result of that accident, she's kind of soured on the entire romance genre. She doesn't buy what romance is selling. Um, and she's moved on and has a, has a really well-established career as a narrator of, you know, let's say important books. Mm -hmm. And, um, she gets an opportunity though, uh, to narrate the last novel of like a legendary romance author, the same author that gave her her start in the industry. And, um, she brings her pseudonym back and agrees to do this project with, the most enigmatic, hottest uh, male narrator uh, in romance audio. And through that relationship and through that project, she learns about not only love, but also self-love and self-acceptance and um, what happens when you're willing to take a risk. Mm-hmm. And we got a little bit of you got male hidden identities, mm-hmm. text messaging, messaging back and forth. Um, so I think if there is a trope, I tried to put it in the book. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Like, it's just like, I thought it was like, it, it really, for me personally, I love the book that the, what it, what is mentioned, like the, the journey of Suwani, like just going through the process of identifying and understanding where she was coming from and then opening herself up and taking risks and trying to do different things, you know, and then understanding like, this is a, this is a whole journey that we're going through. And the groveling. (laughs) Yes, and throwing groveling. (laughs) Yeah, because we just love a grovel scene. We love a grovel. We stand a grovel. You know, like, (laughs) I have to go to Italy to grovel. Yes, keep coming up. Fine, (laughs) put them in Italy. Like, I'll do anything. I will will take them anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your favorite part of writing this book? Um, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed bringing as much love as I have for that genre. Um to bear on my own story. I I wanted it to be, you know, it was, it was written mostly during the pandemic um, at a time when nothing felt romantic or funny. And so being able to just kind of anchor myself in like my love of romance tropes and um, 
the kind of thought experiment of like, what if you found yourself living out these romance tropes? Would you trust them? Mm -hmm. Because that's the biggest thing I was coming up against is like, she's, she just is like, I don't believe any of this is real. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was, that was very fun for me. Oh, that sounds like fun. All right. So this might be an interesting question to ask. What kind of books do you gravitate in your personal life, not in the work life? Mm-hmm. You know? um, well, the problem is for me, I just don't have a lot of time to read electively. Um, so I'm so behind. And uh, I, I, you know, my go-to is, is romance. Um, I think for, you know, at the end of the day, when I'm just like ready to be done, with everything. I, I read romance. Um, but I also, uh, I will, I came up through, you know, a literary fiction tradition. So I also lean really heavily on that when I want like the, just the prose to feed me, um, in the same way that, you know, you would read poetry or something to just see words in a different way. So I, I've, I've, I would say those are the ones I gravitate to. I also love historical fiction, love, that's probably my favorite. Um, so within all of those different categories, literary, historical, romance, historical, all of that, that's pretty much where I gravitate. I love this. And so do you have any books to recommend, whether it's workbooks or regular books or just any books you're like, you know, stand out for the year? You're like, okay. Oof. <laughs> you know. Wow. Um, well, I, sure. I mean, of course I, uh, since we're talking about this, like, I, I think if we just talk about kind of like the books that made me, cause they're all over the place. So I will try to steer clear of books I narrated just for the purposes of fairness. <laughs> um, but definitely. So middle March, uh, mm-hmm. by George Eliot, the, the old, you know, Victorian doorstop of, yep. a, of a novel, yep. um, is my favorite novel. And it, I lean on it very heavily in my first book, my Oxford year. Um, but if we go back before that, when I was a 12 year old, I read the true confessions of Charlotte Doyle by Mm -hmm. Avi and that book built me. Um, I became a different person because of that book. Um, and I would say like, again, in terms of the books that feed me, I think, uh, Wolf Hall. Mm-hmm. in terms of literary historical just blows my mind and bring up the bodies um so yeah uh and then in the romance side of it any loretta chase novel yeah <laughs> any loretta chase novel does both things does both things for me i appreciate the romance but then i also am just like so jealous that she can write like that Mm-hmm. she yeah. blows my mind <laughs> yeah she does oh so great awesome so julia tell us where you can find you online oh i'm on twitter i'm on instagram i am nominally on tiktok but i honestly don't i forget to do anything on there um <laughs> but i am there and it's uh, my handle is the same on everything which is just julia Whalen. awesome thank you julia for being on the show absolutely thank you for having me if you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share with friends, subscribe, rate, and review the show. This is the easiest way to support the podcast. For a list of books mentioned and other romance recommendations, please visit whatchwernextblog.com. Did you know you can purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore? With Librafem, you can pick up more than 250,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from real booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company, you know the name, but you'll be part of a different story, one that supports the local community. If you're new to audiobooks, there's a perfect way to squeeze more reading into your busy life. Listen with the free Libra FM app while you do your chores, walk the dog, relax at home. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen next, check out recommendations from people who know the best booksellers. The Watch Your Next podcast has a special offer for our listeners. Get to audiobooks on Libra FM for the price of one with your first month membership. Use code What Should We Next. The offer is valid only for new members in Canada and the U.S. The Watch Your Next podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Please visit frolic.media slash podcast to discover new shows to tune in. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.